It's my pleasure today to introduce our guest lecture here at the Natural History Museum, our lunchtime lecture series. We have Rachel Witt, who is one of our own working here at the Natural History Museum. She has her degree from Vanderbilt in anthropology in 2012. And she's going to talk with us today about Peruvian warfare, bioarchaeology, damage to bones and skulls. So again, thank you everybody for coming. We're excited to have you and hear about your talk. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have all heard of the Inca, which is an empire that expanded its boundaries across the Andes, covering the modern day countries of Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. But this impressive empire maintained this coercion through military conquests, sophisticated road systems, through administrative centers and estates, one the most well-known being Machu Picchu, and rituals that ven venerated the mummified remains of ancestors. Uh, this sophisticated empire, however, was not literate in the modern day sense. This society did not have a written record, but they kept track of things like census data and tax data on recording devices called quipus, which you see on the, the right. Okay, that's behind me. Oh yeah, modern scholars debate on uh, how to translate these quipus, therefore much of under, our understanding of Andean prehistory comes from the accounts of Spanish chroniclers and conquistadors, the most renowned being uh, Felipe Guama Palma de Aya, which are two, he wrote a book of famous illustrations and accounts of the Incan Empire, two of which are shown behind me. Uh, the Incan oral histories of societies that existed before them, however, weren't considered real history to the Spanish chroniclers. They just thought that these accounts were fantastical mythologies and didn't have any historical credence. Therefore, oops, sorry. Therefore, archaeology is particularly useful in understanding these pre-Hispanic societies because they study the ceramics, the textiles, and the architecture from the archaeological record. However, waqueros, which is a Spanish for looters, are quite common in Peru, so many archaeological sites have been robbed of their material goods. However, in many cases, only the skeletal evidence remained, which is lucky for bioarch because what we study is the human skeletal skeletal remains. And bioarchy is useful for understanding diet, workload, health, exposure to violence, and even migration patterns. So in particular, study of bioarchaeology and uh, specifically the study of traumatic injuries provides a highly useful index for assessing patterns of violence and conflict in earlier societies. By looking at uh, instances of trauma, we can um, understand um, the forms of resistance and a disregard for the physical well-being of these marginalized populations. In some cases, we can observe for things like uh, sacrifice and trophy head taking, which is the dismemberment and the subsequent secular or non-secular use of the human head. So augmenting the skeletal data with material evidence, such as um, iconography on ceramics and textiles, we can interpret the motivations and intentions behind violent encounters in the Andes. So dozens of cultures have been documented in Peru and study. However, today I'm only going to focus on three. First, the Nazca Society, which was on the south coast, central coast of um, the south coast of Peru. Next, the Moche State, which was on the north coast, and then the Wari Empire. So beginning with the Nazca, they thrived approximately 100 BC to 700 AD. The Nazca of the south central coast is a region that is considered one of the most formidable deserts in the world. The Nazca had to exploit the maritime resources from the ocean and the inland river valleys where sufficient water and adequate soils could be found. Droughts were very common and consistent shortages in resources, especially vi viable farmland and water, were a problem that the Nazca faced. Much of what we know about the Nazca culture can be observed on the ceramics and the iconography painted on these. Depictions of battle scenes with warriors holding severed human heads, weapons such as spears and clubs are a common theme. These weapons have been recovered in the Nazca's archaeological record, indicating that these depictions were not mythologies or imagined myths, but actually these might um, actually portray actual events. And also, trophy heads are you that are see pictured, like for here and since here, okay. A disembodied head is pictured there, and those are also found in the Nazca archaeological record. So how did the Nazca 
create a trophy head. First, they enlarged the foramen magnum, which is the opening for the spinal cord found at the base of the cranium. Then they would drill or break a small hole into the frontal bone, which is just basically your forehead. And then they would insert a wooden toggle into the cranium and then string a carrying cord through the punctured hole. And that was used to carry and hold the trophy head and even for display. So the taking of trophy heads has a long history in the Andes. It begins with the Chavin culture, which, is, which began about 2000 BC, and even all the way through history, and even the Inca created trophy heads. However, each culture had their own unique ceremonies associated with trophy head taking. Some of them had ritual significance. Some of them were just to intimidate and terrorize their enemies. So looking at the bioarchaeology, what can we learn about the role of trophy head taking in Nazca society? So in Verano's study, he analyzed 84 trophy heads and he believed, well, he hypothesized that the trophy heads belonged to vanquished warriors and were used to intimidate and terrorize the enemies. Well, if you think about it, that makes sense because there's nothing scarier or an image scarier than seeing your enemy marching towards you carrying heads. So, so if his theory was correct, we would expect to see trophy heads of all males and we would expect these males to age of the be the age of the military draft age, so about late teens, early 20s, all the way through middle adulthood, so about 30s, 40s, 50s. And so in his study, he found that 85% of the trophy heads were male and only 12% were children and females. So this data suggests that it was combat, not ritual, was the sole purpose of taking heads. And acquisition of heads was not the main objective of such rituals, as one would expect males, females, and children to, to um, take up the entire sample. It would be a more equal distribution of the sex in the sample. So one would assume that these trophy heads belong to foreign enemies, meaning from warriors not local to the Nazca region. So to check this theory, Knudsen and other bioarchaeologists decided to conduct stable isotope analysis on the enamel of the heads to identify the heads' geographic origins. So this is a very quick summary of it. It's a lot more complicated of this, but basically they wanted to look at strontium found in these trophy heads enamel in their teeth. So strontium occurs naturally in the bedrock. So when plants grow, strontium is incorporated into the plants and then the animals eat those plants and incorporate the strontium into their system. And then humans eat the plants and those animals. And so they're incorporating that, the strontium uh, particular to that region into their, their bones and into their bodies. And it, because the Andes are such a geographically variable region, there are diff many different signatures throughout the Andes. So it's ideal for understanding geographic origins. And the, the you know, Knudsen and others decided to look at enamel of the first molar because the first molar completes growth and erupts at age six. So they could, under, whatever strontium signature was encased in that enamel, they would, that would be the signature of the of the region where these trophy heads grew up before the age of six, where they spent their childhood. So the strontium isotope signatures indicate that the majority, the ones that are shown, well, you can't see it, there's a red box shown right here, indicate that, well, the signatures indicate that the trophy heads derive from populations within the Nazca region. So the Nazca trophy heads, if they derive from this region, Knudsen states that transforming local Nazca individuals into trophy heads highlights their ritual role in Nazca society. So augmenting all this information together, the Nazca lived in an environmentally hostile region, and so they were concerned with uh, obtaining an adequate amount of food and water. So this led to inter-community competition over resources, hence these warring communities and people terrorizing one, in one another to obtain trophy heads. However, they also wanted to appease the spiritual powers that controlled these forces of nature. And so these trophy heads must have had some sort of ritual significance to them. And we even see iconographically that on the, okay, on the right, that's a, it's called the harvester. That's an icon found on a Nazca ceramic. He's holding these strange looking figures and those are actually plants he's holding. And in the image on the left, you see these disembodied hens, heads and protruding from their mouths are these same kind of um, stylized plants. So this indicates that while these trophy heads were violently obtained, they ultimately served a ritual role in the Nazca society. All right, so moving on next to the moche. Moche thrived from about 200, BC, from 200 AD to 750 AD. 
The Moche civilization is located on the Peruvian north, north coast. It is also located in an arid desert, but it's not nearly as formidable as where the Nazca were located, as the north coast has more river valleys and more productive agricultural lands as well. Archaeologists believe that the Nazca society was complex and they, 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 they lived in a stratified society. And they even went so far as to have very elaborate cities. This is an image of the Ciudad Moche outside of Trujillo, and it actually exhibits organized urban planning. So the, Na the Moche are most well known for their detailed and elaborate vessels. We see military themes as, as well as warriors being sacrificed on these ceramics. This scene, this scene in particular shows a presentation of sacrifices being or bound captives along with severed heads, severed limbs, and even on the, far, on the far left, you can even see a little vulture being portrayed. So were these captives honorific sacrifices? In the Andes, there is a long history of people being sacrificed to honor the gods. Like during the Inca period, it was considered an honor if your child was chosen to be a sacrifice to the mountain gods. Or were these treatments of bodies of executed cap captives meant to terrorize and humili humiliate them? So we can look at these bioarchaeological contexts of where these um, human skeletal remains are and see if they are accompanied by honor, um, sumptuary goods, if they were treated well in this burial, or if there is desecration of the corpse. So to understand this, we're going to examine two separate sacrificial contexts in the Moche society. First, uh, Pakitak Namu is a mass burial trench located outside of a ceremonial precinct. There are patterns, the patterns of wounds and post-mortem treatment of the victims show close parallels to artistic depictions of sacrificial scenes. For instance, they found, um, the archaeologists found ropes around these individuals' ankles. There was post-mortem um, treatment of the bones, meaning the individuals were exposed to the elements for a while. The bones were sun bleached, and there were bug cases, casings located in these bones, and there was even surface weathering. And their location at the entrance of a ceremonial plaza, they were definitely very much on display to the public, and that's a very prominent location to be shown. And then they were ultimately denied a proper moche bur burial. Dif um, burials in the moche society, it, they were, individuals were buried in the extended position in their own burials. However, these individuals are, you can just see from the, articulate, from the remains, they're disarticulated, everyone's scattered about and thrown, it looked like they were thrown in on top of one another. And the only objects found associated with these cap um, captives were the fragments of vessels shaped like seated seated captives. As you see this guy, he's, he's seated, his hands are bound behind him, and he even has a rope around his neck. All right, and the second context is one of the largest sacrificial contexts in the Andes. It's from the Waka, Waka del Moche, or it's specifically at Waka de, de la Luna in Plaza 3C in the Moche capital city that I showed you earlier. There are complete and articulated skeletons but also individuals are missing their skulls, are missing their limbs, are missing their hands, and there are also just isolated bones found. So these uh, skeletal remains, there were osteological indicators of poor health. None of these individuals had pathologies, but many exhibited healed injuries and healed traumas. All of them were male between that aforementioned military draft age. So among the anti-mortem, injuries, we found depressed cranial fractures to the skull, and we also found fractures to the lib, limbs and the, fore, and the long bones. In particular, we found peri fractures to the ulna and radius. Now, a peri fracture of the forearm indicates interpersonal violence, demonstrating that a person attempted to parry a blow to the head. So if you're facing a right-handed attacker and they come swing at you, your instinct is to put up an arm and block them. Thus, that will result in breaking your forearm. So the location of these wounds suggests that these injuries weren't obtained accidentally, but they were obtained during for, uh, some form of interpersonal violence, possibly during combat. Now, perimortem injuries, which mean these injuries occurred around the time of death and might have even been the cause of death, were found on these individuals of, as well. Cut marks were found on the upper, on your cervical vertebras, which are the, the bones you have in your neck. The cut marks were all horizontal and they occurred on 75% of the victims. They found these cut marks. Um, <clears throat> the location of the cut marks suggest 
or that, that they, these cut marks were sustained when an attacker tried to slit the individual's throat. And this interpretation actually corresponds to Moche artistic depictions of um, individuals slashing the throats of captives to collect blood. And as we see here on the, okay, on the right, you can see there's um, a captive having his throat slashed. You can even see little flakes of blood coming, spewing from his throat. Now, this, there are other type of um, perimortem trauma were skull fractures, fractures, and they were generally very massive, something that would not have been, something that was obviously produced by a blow to the head by a very large blunt object. So we understand that the, the, these victims are definitely sacrifices and they were not given honorific burial in any way, but like what we saw with the Nazca, who were these individuals? Were they locals to the region or were they non-local warriors who were captured during a military conquest? Now, it is possible that they could be locals because it's t in the Andes. There's a long history of ritual battles that people have, that groups have with one another kind of to let out their aggression. So maybe it was, this was one of the cases or were they non-local warriors? So um, bioarchaeologists uh, Richard Sutter and John Verana decided to determine if these captives were biologically moche. So what they did they determined biological distance or biodistance, which basically means that populations that share a heritable, heritable trait, means that a trait that's inherited, are more related than populations who don't have this trait. So looking at dental traits, so they looked at these individuals' dentition, they compared two separate populations. They compared moche burials that were the proper burials, so people who were definitely of the moche culture, and they compared those to the sacrificial victims of the Waka de la Luna. And they found that these two groups were genetically different, suggesting that the Moche sacrificial victims were a non-local enemy combatant. So if they were non-local, who were these people? Well, an archaeologist named George Lau, he looked at this Moche festival and decided to analyze the painted scene on there. And he found that there were two separate groups of people portrayed on this scene. First, there were Moche warriors who are identified by their conical shaped heads, they're wearing tunics, and they're even wearing a back flap as part of their garb. However, there was a second group of figures, and they display different headdresses and different weapons. And more interestingly, I should go back. In, in this scene, the people who are dressed like Moche seem to be the ones who are winning the fight. They are, they're in the processing, uh, process of administering a blow to one of the non-Moche figures. So George Lau thinks that these, the non-local Moches were from the Rakwai culture, which is in the highlands. If you go directly inland from where the Moche were, you find the Rakwai, because there are stone monoliths in the Rakwai cultural area that where, are wearing headdresses and are carrying weapons that resemble these artistic depictions. So, I'm oh, sorry. So a lot of still some work needs to be done to understand what if these captives were where these captives were from and maybe even shed light on the types of militaristic expansion the Moche were trying to achieve. So last I'm going to talk about the Wari Empire which thrived across the Andes from 600 to 1000 AD. The Wari Empire was a powerful state and it's actually considered the first expansive empire in South America. Some people say that the Inca might have taken ideas like road systems from the Wari. To gain and sustain control over distant regions, empires make use of local established infrastructure or they might establish entirely intrusive and foreign administration. The Wari Empire may have um, exercised what is considered a mosaic of control, meaning that they might have invoked several strategies to incorporate these regions of the Andes into their dominion. One intrusive strategy, for instance, is the, um, the site of Sierra Baul. It's a millet, it's, in the top picture. It's a hilltop defensive structure, and uh, it's believed that warriors were re relocated to this strategic site in this defensive position to better survey the populace and also to serve as an intimidating kind of lording over you people. Alternatively, uh, Wari also established provincial administrative c centers like in Hon Honko Pampa. They're fi they find patio group administrative centers there as well as D-shaped structures that are typically Wari. And this suggests maybe in that region, which is located in the Central Highlands, there may have been more of a Wari colony, that there wasn't that much, that strong of a presence there. And last, Wari like to implement their own ideological beliefs. So in many places, you'll find Wari burial practices, meaning 
the individuals will be buried in the Wari style, which is in a seated flex position, and the tomb may even include Wari ceramics. So st studies have shown that the Wari, while, they, while the archaeology demonstrates that they exercised a mosaic of control, the bioarchaeology demonstrates that actually the Wari were a very violent people. They expanded through military campaigns, acquiring trophy heads to intimidate and coerce these communities. So you see a ton of cranial trauma in these regions. Now, in, this north, in the Northern Highlands, it's a different story. Archaeologists, everyone is just debating on whether Wari was even expanded their empire that far north because you have evidence of Wari ceramics that might suggest trading, but they don't actually know if Wari actually made it all the way up into the North Highlands. Instead, people believe that the hi Northern Highlands just had autonomous polities that were well outside the empire's ha heartland. So popu populations that are so removed from this militar militaristic empire, were they as violent as the Wari or being outside of such a violent empire, did that make them more peaceful? So for my senior honors thesis, I did a preliminary study of a site in the North Central Highlands to understand how, these, how the violence differed from there, from the Wari Empire. The site is called um, Walkayon. It's a large multi-component site in the North Central Highlands. It contains two pyramid structures, several plazas, and at least two cemetery sectors. The earliest occupation is about 900 BC, but I decided to focus on tombs that date from 600 to 1000 AD. I focus on the osteological remains found in one tube. There are about 30, a minimum number of 30 individuals. And among those individuals, there was a significant amount of cranial trauma among adults and even among ju juveniles. Shown here, these are photos from two separate juveniles. Both exhibit blunt force cranial trauma that was definitely sustained at the time of death and probably was the cause of death. And one child even exhibits eight separate points of blunt force trauma. Among the adults, Four out of the seven adult crania found exhibited trauma. Then they were found on both males and females. Now, to understand the distribution of wounds, I mapped out the points of trauma and found that many of the wounds were found on the posterior of the cranium, or meaning they were found on the back of the head. Now, these were blows that were caused that were, sustain, that were sustained on the back of the head, meaning that an attacker came up behind them, sort of ambushed them, and hit them in the back of the head. And these are all considered to be defensive wounds, meaning they were probably sustained while a victim was fleeing from their attacker or while they were crouched in a face down position trying to protect themselves. So looking at this information, we find that these wounds are brutally administered. The frequency of blowns, for example, that child who had eight separate points of blunt force trauma, and also women as well as children were victims of this. So this was particularly an internecine type of warfare. And the posterior wounds suggest that these individuals were victim of raids. That means an intrusive force was coming into this region and terrorizing them. So it's possible, and I hypothesize that the possible, it's possible that the limited worry presence in this region was unable to control these warring polities and control these people who were just out to get one another and compete. However, is it possible that Wari influence in this region is greatly underestimated? Maybe these wounds were caused by this intrusive Wari force that we know from before is highly militaristic. And I say that because not three days ago, if this was announced on, on the news on Thursday, so yeah, three days ago, two days ago, that a covered in the uh, North Central Highlands of Peru is this huge royal tomb. And they found all sorts of things. They found ceramics. They found what you see here. Those are gold earrings. And this tomb is, called, is located in El Castillo de Warmi, and that's approximately 175 miles north of Lima. Now, to, as you can see here, Wari, that's their capital city I have circled. And this shaded area represents the definite Wari domain. Well, that's kind of far away. That's definitely really, really far from them. And to have a, a burial this elaborate that is definitely belongs to someone who was an elite individual in this society makes you wonder, well, okay, if the Wari aren't in, if everyone says the Wari aren't in this region, then why, are, then why are they there? Why are we finding them there? And this distance, it's a little hard to demonstrate this on the map, but I, I Google mapped it. And to the driving distance between Wari and um, Warmi is about 11 hours, and that's by a car. So imagine if you're on foot in the Andes, that's a really long journey. 
So just a little description of the burial, because this was so cool. Make sure you go home and look it up on National Geographic's website. But they found uh, 63 burials. It was rich in many grave goods. And they found three elite women buried in the warrior style. That means like seated in the um, crouch position. And they even found about 60 victims who were sacrificed. Now this is just announced, so there's still a lot of work to be done with this. So today, I hope I demonstrated to you that bioarchaeology is useful for augmenting all the other archaeological evidence that we're used to seeing, like textiles and ceramics and architecture, to understand how sacrifice warfare and trophy head taking led to were types of violent encounters that occurred in the Andes. And also I've demonstrated, because I've left a lot of unanswered questions, that there's still a lot of work to be done. So thank you for coming out today. <laughs> Are there any questions? They, that's a good question. Well, in the Andes, they actually have a long history. Well, okay, let me back up. Because I at first was wondering what they would think if we're the ones going into their tombs and you know pulling out their ancestors. But actually, it's documented that during the Inca period, during Days of the Dead feast, they would actually bring out the mummified remains of their Inca emperors and kind of set them out and parade them around. and have them they would even like set up a meal for them and have them talk to one another so there is a history of them going and revisiting burials and and so in that case like they can kind of understand when we explain to them like okay well we're, we're learning from them this is like we're learning about your past and we're learning from them most people are okay with it I know in one case they don't they don't they're okay with you doing it but they don't want to have anything to do with it because where I've worked we've had this small field house that was an um joined next to one of the locals houses and whenever we'd excavate bones and have to bring them back to the field house they were like you can't have that in here because they, they thought it would be bad like just kind of bad vibes from it so we had to keep them in our room so it's like you're sitting there on your cot and there's like human bones surrounding your bed and students come in you're like what are you doing <laughs> but they're they're usually very okay with it like we don't usually get a lot of trouble in a lot of cases these tombs have already been looted and so that's all that remains. So if we come from the perspective saying, we're just trying to preserve what we can and what is left of it. So usually if you come from it from that perspective, people... Bones come back here to be studied? No, we can't take them out of the country. That they not like that. They, you have to like go through a lot of paperwork. If you want to do like um, chemical testing, like the strontium testing, you have to bring it back, but it's a ton of paperwork and, and so... Usually whenever we study them, for instance, you might get three years to keep them in your site's lab, and then they go to the region's museum. So that could be the main museum in Lima. It could be another one, in the closest big city museum that there is. Yeah, a lot of times they'll just be sitting there on the surface and make it. This is really dark. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I... It's kind of dark there, but yeah, I worked on a friend's project and you could walk up to the tomb and there are just bones like spilling out literally. And so it's almost, it's a little morbid because you're thinking, oh, like whoever looted this or whatever, they just left him out. That's kind of, it's very disrespectful. That, they had to excavate a lot. I can't remember exactly how much they said they had to excavate, but that, on, it was, they had to go down through a lot, a lot of rock. And they just announced this the other day, but they've been working on this for years, but they were afraid of looters and anybody knowing what they're doing. But they had to, they, they were saying they had to uncover layers and layers of rocks. I don't wanna, for some reason, I wanna say 35 feet, but that sounds so excessive. But for some reason, that's how deep it was. That's what's sticking up my, my mind from reading the article. Um, in some of the case, like tombs, like the, phrases okay people were very predictable on where they built their tombs like the some of these i have shown here are built up up against a rock cliff face and if you walk around this rock cliff face you just keep coming after sections of tombs so in that way they're a little bit predictable and then in some regions they built these huge uh, freestanding structures called cholpas which are also tombs and they'll just be in the middle of a field and it's just this very obvious like i bet there's a tomb in there so a lot of times they're not very well hidden so they're, they're pretty obvious if you look around. Um, I know in some cases, the site I worked at last summer, we had to excavate through layer after layer of sediment. That's because whenever in the Andes, they like to, 
whenever there's a big ceremony or anything, they'll like have their ceremonial event. They'll you know drink drink their chicha beer and they'll sacrifice something, but then they'll cover it with a layer of sediment and then build on top of that. And then if that site's abandoned and then people come back later to it because they've heard like, oh, this site is really old. It has this great myth, um, mystical, pres uh, they're, like that culture or these people were there like hundreds of years ago. So we know it's a really holy spot. So they'll build on top of that. And it's, it's kind of like the parallel I can think to that in, in Europe, a lot of churches are built upon Roman, um, sanctuaries. So if you go down the church's catacombs, they're usually built upon Roman sanctuaries. So it's kind of like this place was once holy, so we're going to keep make we're going to keep building on top of it because this is like a sacred area. Did that answer your question? Oh, it's been going on forever. Like some people say even before the Spanish arrived that some sites were looted, but definitely after the Spanish came because one of the way the Spanish wanted to try to convert everybody to Christianity, they decided to remove things that were key to Incan ideology and Incan religion. For example, the mummies, which were, um, what's the word, worshipped and revered. The, so um, Spanish priests would come and destroy, find these tombs and loot them and destroy these mummies. And of course, if there's gold in there, well, of course they're going to take that. <laughs> so, so they have been looted since then. And there are also sites that, like the one I've worked at last summer, there's actually our director, she's very savvy and like with these this um, community relations because she actually met some of the looters who live in the village who have looted these sites and just to kind of keep them from keep on looting, she tries she like befriends them and be like, Oh well show me what you took and like, oh where are other sites that you've looted and they'll like show her and so she'd be like, Okay, we're gonna excavate this because we're gonna we have this paper from the Peruvian government, you can't come here anymore. <laughs> so she's she knows how to, she really knows how to do it. Cause at first we've actually, I think my first day at this particular site two years ago, it was like my first, second day there. And we were excavating at this isolated tomb away from everybody else. And this guy comes up and he starts yelling at us. Like you, you're Americans. You're just stealing all of our treasures to take and sell. And like started like yelling at us. And he had kind of like a ax or something with him. And our, the crew chief like phoned down like the director and be like, we have a, someone up here is really upset with us. And so everybody had to like run up there, but then the looter like escaped. It was this whole dramatic event. He like escaped down into the valley and we were like, let's follow him, see where he goes. But so you still have it happen. And even in between, like when we don't go and excavate and then we come back a couple of weeks later, you can tell like they've even gone and like taken the nails where we've like made GPS points. And so you're like, well, I guess we have to map this out again. So it's, it has gone on and it probably will continue going on. <laughs> I know that's. <laughs> um, there are actually, there's a kind of subfield of bioarchaeology. It's like the study of taphonomy. And a lot of bioarchaeologists are studying the environmental weathering and sun bleaching on bones to understand at what time or how long these bones have been exposed before it reached this state. And I don't know a lot about it. I'm trying to learn more about it. but. According to them, they can look at bones and tell like, oh, this has been exposed for this amount of time, or this has just been exposed for ages. And what's crazy about the Andes, they have like right now is the dry season is like their summer, but during the winter, it's torrential downpours. It just rains every single day. And so in, in that like extreme sort of environment with all of these extreme factors going on, I would imagine it would be very hard to put an exact date of when this was looted. Then they, I, they would just deflesh it. Like on some, I didn't go into this, but sometimes you can find cut marks that are consistent so with the Sometimes they would dry them out like a, f I think I showed, might have been hard to see. Sometimes they would dry them out in the Nazca region. That's very, very, right. yeah. Like, yeah, the two on the left and right. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see them better. Yeah, sometimes they would just let let them dry out and shrivel up. And other times, like during the Wari Empire, they probably deflesh them because we find cut marks that are consistent with defleshing. So it, it might have just been a preference and who was in charge of it because a lot of times something that appears like the location of the punctured hole is always around the same place. So there is some kind of standardization to this. But I would imagine, oh, even that, yeah, one of them, they showed their eyes shown, sewn shut. I just looked at that. <laughs> you learn something new every day. So I think I've, I've seen different processing, like trophy heads being processed, but a lot of, a lot of times if they, 
have been exposed to the elements for so long because a lot of Nazca trophy heads, like my undergraduate advisor, she did her dissertation on Nazca trophy heads and she literally was wandering around in the desert because they were just scattered on the ground and she just stopped next to one and record it and then move on to the next one. So yeah, they were just there exposed. So if you're exposed to that, to things like vultures and scavengers and things like that, then there was dried skin on it, might not be there anymore. So. Um, I want to say yes. There is, okay, I'm thinking of one. There is a case, it's on the north coast. It wasn't contemporary with Moche. It might have been later. They have found cut marks on long bones and around um, the, the, the different ends where the joints are because they think they were trying to cut them to like dismember them. And then the way that the bones are broken, they might have been extracting cartilage. They think that, but Cut marks are so difficult to say, oh, this is human made, this is man made, because if it's a sharp incision, you can say it's a knife or it's, some, or it's just from one tooth. So they, they come out and say this and that it was caused by cannibalism, but there's just a whole problem with the ty like typ typology of identifying remains that have been processed by hum humans as opposed to by animals. Mm -hmm. I don't know any I know. I, it's a little more complicated to excavate human skeletal remains in North America because if human remains are found, they might belong to Native Americans. And so NAGPRA, which is the Native American Protection and Repatriation Act, which means if you find um, human skeletal remains on public land, whatever tribe is associated with that region, then they can claim that, oh, this, these are our ancestors, so you can't excavate them or dig them up. But if it's on private land, then it's the property owners. They can do what they want at their discretion. But that, that law in itself kind of limits the amount of bioarch. There's been a lot done prior to that. Mm -hmm. and there's no record of lots of trophy heads or anything. You, you do see scalping. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only thing that's sticking up to me. You see a lot of scalping, like when they, because you'll, you'll see on the cranium like cut marks that shows they were trying to remove part of their, yeah, the skin on their head. <laughs> yeah, that stays. <laughs> yeah, we get us, depending on whatever contract we have with the Peruvian Ministry of Culture, we're allowed to keep it and study it for a certain amount of time. For instance, the site I've been working at, we get it for about three years, and then the region's museum, like for instance, the closest one is in the city called Waraz, and they have the regional museum, and then we hand it over to them. And so it's actually highly illegal to bring uh, Peruvian ceramics out of the country, yeah. And there's been, in recent years, there have been a lot of trouble with it. Like, Yale had a ton of artifacts from Machu Picchu. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>